enlighten. Welcome to the webinar on paradigm shift in higher education system in the light of national education policy organized by IQAC Bishop Abraham Memorial College Thuritika in collaboration with Indian Accounting Association IAA Alipura branch. May I request Ms. Swapna K, Assistant Professor in Commerce, MSS College Ottapalam, an Executive Committee member of IAA to officially welcome everyone joined in this platform. Thank you. Thank you, Kaida ma'am. Very good afternoon to one and all present here. Uh, we have gathered here for a webinar on the paradigm shift in higher education system in the light of NEP organized by Bishop Abraham Memorial College, Turtikar, in collaboration with Indian Accounting Association, Alapura branch. As we all know, NEP has become a reality now. However, the debate on the pros and cons continues among academic committee. Now, our state Kerala also come up with its own model of education policy and already a decision to implement four year degree program from the next academic year onwards is taken by the government of Kerala. Along with this, our higher education system is also facing huge challenges, both in terms of quality and quantity. The existing reforms in the sector hope to address such issues. Whatever be the orientation of reforms, it is a fact that the higher education sector is undergoing a paradigm shift. Webinars like this will definitely help to create more clarity on the ongoing reforms. Today, we have the best resource person with us, Dr. Shekila Shamzuma, who has been an elemental part in the formulation and implementation of the NEP. Now, let me move forward to my duty. It's my pleasure to introduce and welcome Dr. Shekila Shamzu, ma'am. Dr. Shekila Shamzu, having served as an officer on special duty in the Central Ministry's Department of Higher Education, was appointed as secretary to NEP draft committee. Her career spans four decades in teaching and academics in the universities of Mumbai, IGNU, and 14 years in the government of India. She has held senior positions in the Indian government and played key roles in the higher education sector and have also received various education awards. About her qualifications, she holds a PhD in distant education, gold medalist for masters, PG diploma in distant education, and a degree in law. She has to her credit a number of articles in international journals, book contributions, and in the preparation of 11th and 12th plan and government reports. She has addressed several national and international conferences within and outside the country. Currently, she is the Honorable Advisor on Education to CPPR and Member and Governing Council India MUN, a Pan India UN Group for Youth in Climate Action. She has been honored among 100 honorees of Muslim women in Kerala by the initiative of Rising Beyond the Ceiling and wandering as a mentor under Women Mentorship Program. Her expertise is now fruitfully utilized in leading discussions on NEP recommendations. I consider myself privileged to welcome Dr. Shakila Shamzu Ma'am to this session. Ma'am, in the name of BAM College and IAA Alapura branch and all the participants over here, I wholeheartedly welcome you to the session. Then we have many more dignitaries here. Next, I would like to welcome uh, the principal of BM College, Dr. Nidhu George, who is also uh, from our Commerce Fraternity. Uh, welcome, ma'am. Ma'am, welcome to the session. Now, uh, I'd like to welcome Professor Gabriel Simon Tatil, sir. Uh, Simon, sir, is a well known professor from the University of Kerala, and he's an integral part of Indian Accounting Association. Now, he's a chief editor of IAA, and the most important matter is this year. Uh, University of Kerala is hosting uh, the International Conference of Indian Accounting Association and Simon sir is a conference secretary. Sir, with much respect, I welcome you to the program. Next, I'd like to welcome the IQAC coordinator of BAM College, Dr. A.B. Joseph Edicula. 
All the arrangements and supports for this webinar is done by the IQAC of BAM College. Sir, uh, I welcome you to the session. And the seminar coordinator, Dr. Roby AJ, who is the all in all of the program. Thankfully, I welcome Roby sir to the session. And here, from the part of Indian Accounting Association, we have Dr. Anthony sir from SP College, who is the president of Indian Accounting Association, Alapura branch, and Dr. Vinay Chandra from SD College, who is the secretary of Indian Accounting Association, Alapura branch. I, with much esteem, welcome both of you to the program. I also take this opportunity to welcome all the executive members of IAA and all the faculties of BAM College, and last but not the least, all the participants over here. With due regards, once again, I welcome you all to the program. Let's hope we will have a fruitful session ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Sadhna Ma'am, for your warm words of welcome. It is indeed a matter of great pride and privilege for both IQAC of BAM College and IAA to have with us Dr. Shakila Samso, the eminent educationist and policymaker who has played an inevitable role in the framing of NEP. With pleasure, may I invite Dr. Shakila Shamsu to share her insights regarding the paradigm shift in higher education system in the light of national education policy. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Kavita, uh, for your warm words of welcome and to Dr. Swapna, uh, to Dr. A.B. Joseph, who has been the person in touch with me uh, to take this particular session, to all the members of uh, the college and MA College as it is called. I hope I'm right in the name of the college. It's uh, MA College, right? MA College. Ma'am, it's BAM College, Bishop Abraham BAM Memorial College. College. Yeah. Okay, BAM College. And also for the uh, members of the Indian Accounting Association. My apologies for having said it as MA College. It is uh, Bishop uh, College and uh, all greetings to all the participants who are gathered here from both the collaborating institutions. Uh, I have about nearly uh, two hours at my disposal because I think the session is from two o'clock to five o'clock and I'm sure it would be very, uh, I, I think, uh, difficult to listen to a speaker going on rambling for about three hours non-stop, which I can do because that's something I breathe and uh, I'm sort of totally involved into the national education policy. But I think for the sake of interaction, I'm asking uh, whether you would like to share your comments and initial observations from the participant side, and then I speak and then we have it followed up in a sandwich mode for the interaction, or would you like me to just go ahead and talk and then leave about 40 minutes or 45 minutes for interaction. Which one suits you? I mean, Kavita, would you say that or Dr. Rebi can take a call on that? Is it OK that I go on for about two hours, two hours, 15 minutes or so? It's almost about 2.10 now, so maybe I can go on till 4.10 and leave about 40 minutes for interaction. Is that fine or would some of them like to speak first? Ma'am, uh, we definitely want your session first of all, uh, okay. followed by the discussion. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, am I both clear in video and audio? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. I think I'll go by what the organizers would like to have a talk on the national education policy and thereafter take up the discussion with the participants. Thank you for this opportunity for having uh, this interaction and this discussion as rightly pointed out by Kavita and by Swapna. We have now come to terms with accepting that it is almost imperative for us to bring about reforms in higher education, be it through the national education policy or be it through the four year undergraduate program that Kerala is trying to roll out. These are changes which are almost, as I would say, imperative because you need to empower students in the current century to become future ready and to be global citizens. 
Now in that context, what I would really like to put over here is that I'll be talking about the national education policy and putting in the curricular aspects of the Kerala framework as against what the NEP is saying, because there is a slight difference in the way the four year program is thought about on the basis of the Shamanon committee report that Kerala is rolling out and what the NEP is saying. But there are areas where in terms of the curricular structure, there is a lot of similarity because it's a cut copy paste of the UGC guidelines of the four year undergraduate program into the curricular framework. So I, I just want the participants to understand both these aspects and also bring about where are those areas of differences. But like any talk that I give on the national education policy and given the fact that uh, there are a lot of apprehensions about this particular policy uh, at ground level, not only for the implementation challenges, but also in terms of its how it was received over here. And since we are addressing college faculty members based in Kerala, I would like to really put into perspective why policies are brought about and why this particular policy has made certain recommendations in the manner that it has put it across. Firstly, we must understand a policy given in any sector, not just in education, whether it is in health or whether it's in defense or in foreign policy or in uh, nuclear science or in space or relating to youth, women and child in any sector. Policies are brought about because they are responding to certain changes that happens within the larger society, within the economy and within the globe. Therefore, policies can never remain static because so change is an inevitable process that happens, which affects the society, which affects the economy, the kind of jobs that come about, the industries that are developing and so on. So, Given those changes, you cannot have a policy which is 200 years old or which is 100 years old or which may in certain cases be even just 10 years old because of the dynamic changes that are happened within the, happening within the society. In education particularly, these changes have got a lot of ramifications. Ramifications because if you have an education policy which has not attuned itself to the changes that happen within the society, you are likely to actually do a grave injustice to the major stakeholders of that system, who are the students, then the teachers and the educational institutions. So Swapna mentioned about the challenges. One of the greatest challenges that Kerala is facing today as a state, let me put on record, the Niti Aayog in its classification of human development index, puts Kerala on top because of all the social indicators being at the highest level. It literacy rates, whether it is the educational attainments, whether it is health indicators, and all this Kerala stands on the top. But you are seeing today a crisis where a substantial number of young students who have even passed out their secondary stage are migrating not just out of Kerala to other states, but are migrating out of this country. And that's a real challenge. That is something that we need to start looking at and analyzing why that trend is happening. Now, given that scenario, that this is one change that Kerala is, is witnessing, you need to bring about uh, concomitant changes within the system. So coming back to the point that a policy that is brought out, be it of any state, or any nation is because of the changes that happen within the society, the economy, the nation, and the globe. Secondly, any policy that is brought out is not because something was inadequate or something was wrong with a previous policy. That happens if you try to look at it from a political point of view. And we are not here as politicians. We are educators. And we are trying to educate youngsters. And in our role as an educator, we leave out the politics of it. So a policy that is brought out is not because a previous policy was having some defect or because that policy was brought out by a particular government. Policy is 
of any policy is not a gap filling and nor is it an attempt to say that the previous policy was wrong. So in this particular case of education policy, independent India has witnessed three policies. The first one that came out in 1968 as an outcome of the Kothari Commission report, which was a very elaborate exercise to bring out. We had nine working groups. We had a lot of foreigners in those groups. And each of these working groups worked on different themes. Finally, the whole thing was put together as the Kothari Commission report and which came out as the 1968 policy, a crisp document of just about 36 to 38 pages. Now, the report is very voluminous, but the policy was just that much because the sector itself was not so large as it is today. The next one that came out was in 1986. It was not a major committee or so. It was merely a small group of people within the Ministry of Education that brought that out. And that 86 policy was slightly modified in 1992. It doesn't mean I don't want to put this wrong idea that while policies have are only three number, uh, several committees and several commissions were formed to look at various aspects of education on smaller areas, as we may say. But as a policy, which is usually a comprehensive one covering all the subsectors, and looking at all the verticals of education, we've had only two major policies in the previous century, and this policy of 2020, that is the first of the 21st century. So what is distinctive is that this particular policy brought out 20 years after this particular century has situated itself within certain changes that have happened. And those changes are very critical for us to understand why that paradigm shift is necessary in education, in the manner of delivery, in the manner of the teaching learning processes, in the manner in which we allow students to select their courses, the manner in which we weave in open and distance learning and skill education. Why are these so essential today in this century? And I keep repeating this point of this century because there is something distinctive about this century from the previous century. So most of us in our age group, and many of the faculty who are assembled here today would be all people who would have been born in the previous century, whereas all our students have been born in this current century. And that is the huge generational aspect that we need to understand. And what are those changes? The major change is that the turn of the last century, you have seen the onset and the growing impact of information and communication technologies with the computers and the internet which have overtaken other forms of media like the, the printing press which came first overtaken by the radio then overtaken by the television and the mass media that comes about with that and the satellite and so on but then information and communication technologies that came about with the computers and the internet making ourselves saying that we are living in a decade or a age a age that we call the information age where facts, data, information passed on at very fast speed synchronously across the globe because the world got very closely connected. So the globe became a much more connected world because of the advent, advent of ICTs. And that changed the way how we work, how we communicate, how we travel, how we take care of our health, how we take care of our banking requirements, many other things, be it booking a railway ticket, whatever. Obviously, education cannot remain insulated from those changes. As a sector, the sector also would be greatly impacted by the advent of the information and communication technologies. More importantly, as you entered into the 21st century, you have other technologies that we call as the disruptive technologies of artificial intelligence and robotics and big data and machine learning and augmented reality and virtual reality and so on, which, are, which is a much higher level of looking at ICTs because they are disrupting the way we think, we work, we manage our daily lives. They are disruptions that are caused. 
And those disruptions have both advantages and disadvantages. But the most important thing is that as a sector of education, you cannot remain completely alienated from those changes that are happening. So thanks to the artificial generative artificial intelligence, students may be actively using platforms like the chat GPT or BARD and many other forms because this is something that has taken us by storm. So while students are using that, we as teachers and as faculty cannot afford to say that this is something that I'm not familiar with. So I completely remain out of it. You would become irrelevant. You would be completely meaningless to a classroom situation unless you are equally empowered technologically and digitally to use those kind of disruptive technologies to have a more enriched learning experience. The other important aspect is that the nature of education, when you talk about education, you talk about two critical components. You talk about knowledge and you talk about learning. That's what education is all about. The transmission of knowledge or the generation of no, gen, generating new knowledge, that is knowledge production or research. That is what knowledge is all about. And learning is the basis on which we are here because here we are as teachers, not just to teach, but to ensure that the students learn. And therefore learning and knowledge are the two critical components of education. Now both these completely metamorphosed during the beginning of the century and we are going into that phase or we are experiencing that phase. Knowledge as a component has completely changed from being insulated in watertight compartments or silo based knowledge disciplines to becoming what we recognize as Professor Yashpal says porosity of knowledge that knowledge is porous and when you say something is porous there is an osmosis effect which brings about interconnections between knowledge disciplines and knowledge domains which has resulted in new terminologies of interdisciplinarity multidisciplinarity cross disciplinarity transdisciplinarity because knowledge and knowledge disciplines are completely blurring their hard boundaries and they are interacting with one another. There is a cross fertilization that is taking place among knowledge disciplines. And therefore, can we, when that knowledge as a character has changed, continue with single discipline degrees, continue by offering hard degrees in only one specific area? Because if knowledge has become multidisciplinary, and if knowledge has become so broad, broad in its scope, either it is new knowledge domain coming in or a given knowledge discipline itself undergoing a change because of the influence of other disciplines, you cannot then do this injustice of saying that the manner in which I learned a subject because that was re relevant in the 20th century or the way I looked at economics or sociology or engineering or physics or chemistry, any subject, you take it in any discipline, in any area. That has not been the same as it exists today. That has completely changed. So you would do a huge disservice if you are continuing to teach students with only one discipline and saying that you take up eight papers in sociology or eight papers in history or eight paper in English literature or eight papers in Malayalam literature and language, you are not allowing that student to have integration of knowledge disciplines. So the integration of knowledge arises because we have moved towards multidisciplinarity. And this is one character of knowledge that we need that it is not unidimensional, it is not strict disciplinary, and you have moved towards interdisciplinary. I'll come to this point a little while later for other aspects too. Learning also as an important component of an education system has completely changed in the sense that I would urge each one of you here to go through a report which has been written by Jax Delors and it is a UNESCO report titled Learning in the 21st Century, Learning the Treasure Within. The title reads as Learning in the 21st Century to make a distinctive point that learning in the 21st century is different from learning in the previous centuries. And it, it 
refers to four critical pillars of learning and these four pillars we are all familiar with it but i am just trying to put it into a perspective to understand the multi dimensional nature of learning and that is learning to know is the first pillar which is what bulk of us do as teachers the passing on of cognitive knowledge to our students be it in nature of theories concepts facts data that is knowledge transmission which is the bulk of what we do as teachers at the undergraduate level that is the cognitive part of it learning to know the next is what is now emerging in the 21st century learning to do which is the skills component the practical component the experiential component the application of the theoretical knowledge into the world where you apply that theory for problem solving that is the learning to do which is a second pillar of learning the third pillar is learning to live together and to live with others in the 21st century the acceptance of diversity and plurality and pluralistic societies and the aspect of create inculcation of values of compassion and tolerance and sustainable living where you accept that all forms of life contribute to the biodiversity and which is an essential part of sustainable development is something that is very critical you cannot have learning in war torn societies and there are n number of examples that we can talk about what is happening in west asia in our own homeland in manipur in other parts like ukraine anywhere where there is war or strife you cannot have any learning happening it is preconditional that you should have peace to allow for any for that if you want to have peaceful societies you must learn learning how to live together and to live with others the fourth pillar is the most critical part of the 21st century learning and that is learning to be just learning to be and what does it mean it means the self actualization of individual talents potentials and capabilities the recognition that every individual is unique and has different tastes different aspirations different abilities and therefore of making out a very strong case for individualization and customization of learning process process so that you cannot look at all students or if i have 50 people who are here today that all 50 of you think alike have the same taste have the same likes are having the same levels of levels of learning or potentials that is highly fallacious to think that we are all not we if so then we are all robots the difference between us and a robot is that a robot does not have identity of its own it is created by a human being and it behaves in a certain manner and they all can be made to be behave identically whereas we are not geared for that no two children no two human beings are identical in their taste so the four pillars of learning learning to know to do to live together and to live with others and learning to be are not again seen as being distinct but an amalgamation of all this that needs to be taken care of so while you are amalgamating knowledge disciplines you are also amalgamating the four aspects of learning and that is critical in the 21st century why it is critical in the 21st century is that the kind of not uh, undergraduate student that an employer is looking for today is not what we were at our times which where we used to be what we were calling disciplinary depth and specialization depth that we had only in one discipline that was being called is in today's language as an i shaped graduate whereas today an employer wants t shaped graduate there is a bar on the top for t and that is the breadth of knowledge the breadth referring to multiple disciplinary knowledge multiple skills 
multiple competencies because with the advent of disruptive technologies what knowledge disciplines you have learned maybe in a single area can become completely obsolete or completely irrelevant and there may not be job profiles that suit to that areas so the adages that you have heard that we do not know what the jobs of tomorrow look like and that job profiles will keep changing every 7 years 7 years is a very long period to talk about job profiles may be changing as fast as every 6 months or a year this is happening because the disruptive technologies and machine intelligence is challenging the kind of jobs so you can talk about driverless cars so if someone has not had a capability to think of any other kind of a job profile you must realize that having multiple disciplinary exposures will guarantee that you can reinvent yourself with some foundation of some other discipline to take up a new job profile that is the idea why when you talk about holistic integrated multidisciplinary flexible undergraduate program we are allowing students to choose disciplines across various areas because we accept that those areas may come into use and knowing all of it is better than having only one discipline which relevance may be completely threatened in this dynamic changing world of disruptive technologies the other important aspect is that when you are talking about learning and customizing learning you cannot think of only the super intelligent surviving in this world you have to have a sustainable society those who are less intelligent those who may be less competent but at good at something else so somebody may not be good at academics but may be good at music or may be good at dramatics or may be good at sports these are all areas that we should be allowing students to flourish their talents can be optimized so who are we to make a value judgment that someone who is not good at mathematics is a duffer or someone who is not good at literature is a duffer let us understand that a student being unique can have different taste can have different potentials and it is a system that needs to maximize that potential and that is why the national education policy 2020 the underlying principle of this particular policy is to provide for flexibility it is imperative in the 21st century learning to talk about flexible pathways and flexibility in curricular choices flexibility in teaching learning methodologies flexibility in assessment flexibility in the medium of instruction these are all options that arise because of trying to say that you need to look at individualization and customization of learning experiences so that they are optimized and contributes to that individual's growth and development so in this context two other factors that we need to understand why india has to at this particular stage embrace these changes one at a, as a nation today we are having the largest population in the world and that is a human capital that we are able and capable of providing the workforce to the entire world we are also having an advantage there in terms of the demographic profile the age the average age of an indian which is around somewhere like 27 to 29 years so when the whole of the european world china japan korea us and many other countries are having an aging population here we are as a nation with the largest youth population in the world capable of having productive individuals provided they have the right kind of knowledge skills and competencies so what you are normally hearing the demographic dividend it can become a dividend only if the youth the young population of students are empowered with the right kind of knowledge skills competencies that make them productive individuals capable of contributing to their own individual growth and development 
contributing to the societal development, contributing to their industry, to the industrial growth and national development and economic development and becoming what we call truly global citizens. Only then we can call that as a human capital, which is a dividend. And if they are not empowered with this kind of knowledge and skills and they remain unemployed, they remain a dependent population, then you're staring at a demographic disaster. This is the complete factor that we need to understand that if India, as we claim to be in an advantage in terms of the youth power, which can be the human capital that can supply the skilled manpower and the skilled workforce and the intellectual soft power to the globe, it has to ensure that the students are having what we call future ready citizens with the right kind of knowledge and skills. And they cannot be in one area. It has to be a amalgamation of various disciplines and various skills and competencies, what we call the 21st century skills. This, unless you have that as the 21st century skills, you will not be able to think in terms of having the what we are calling as our soft power capability. Globally, as a nation, in the committee of nations, we are committed to the sustainable development goals, which has a time target of 2030. The SDG goals, which are 17 in number, which cover various areas of hunger, poverty, gender, urban planning, transportation, rural livelihoods, uh, health, many other aspects, also for education. The SDG goal four, which reads as that we need to ensure equitable, inclusive and equitable quality education with lifelong learning opportunities for all. So as a nation, we have committed ourselves to ensuring that we will provide or we will ensure inclusive and equitable quality education with lifelong learning opportunities for all. It's a very loaded goal. It is equity, it is inclusion, it is quality, it is talking about lifelong learning opportunities, and it is talking about providing it to each and every individual. And within that 10 sub targets, which cover early childhood care, vocational education, technical and vocational training, technical education, women's education, and so on, teacher training, all other aspects that come within it. Now, in this whole macro context, which I took almost about from 210 to 240, about half an hour, to set that context is because the first thing that we need to acclimatize ourselves as educators, if you are committed to being an educator and a teacher, you must first be able to convince yourself and feel invested in understanding that it is imperative for us to do these reforms and not because somebody has directed you to do it. It can never come. A change can never come if it is externally imposed. A change can happen only if you have internally ingested it to understand that, yes, if I have to be as a teacher relevant, I need to accept these changes. And it is these factors that make it essential, whatever you call, whether it is policy of government of India or Kerala, it is not those factors. Those are all factors. As I say, as educators, we can remain completely blind to it. What is important for us to understand is that if you choose to be a faculty and you have chosen that path, then you need to understand that as a faculty, I need to be relevant to the student. And by the Darwinian theory of evolution that I always quote, which simply says the survival of the fittest and the dinosaur could not survive there because it did not adapt to the changes that were happening around. So if we as teachers do not want to be the dinosaurs in our classrooms, where we become irrelevant to our students and where students run away from us and from the system, then we need to be ensuring that we also adapt to those changing situations. Therefore, you must understand whether whatever the source of recommendation is immaterial. 
but it is imperative today that we bring about these transformations which provide for multidisciplinary education which provide for flexible options which provide for en multiple entry and exit which allow for various multiple pathways and what is the role of the teacher in this changing scenario and how do we embrace internationalization how do we accept the merging of skills within mainstream education how do we expand open and distance learning how do we ensure that teaching and research both get the equal importance how do we incorporate technology for enriched learning experiences all these have to be taken care of now the national education policy since we are here to talk about that it has been approved as you all know in 2020 july 29 three years down the line since we celebrated the third anniversary on 29th of july 2023 kerala has now started with the acceptance of the fact that we need to move towards the four year undergraduate program as an outcome of the sham menon committee report and now on the kerala state higher education council's website it is very gratifying for us to see that the ugc guidelines of the four year undergraduate program is also very much there and if you make a comparison of both these documents you will find that the content of the kerala state four year program is having a substantial part of it drawn from the ugc guidelines that is a very very uh, i would say encouraging development because otherwise we would find ourselves at loggerheads and our students would not get the facility of the mobility that is happening where other students may be getting that now having said that let me come to the national education policy a painstakingly long effort which took about five and a half long years we wrote background and notes on 33 themes that was in october 2014 that we started officially the consultation for the nep started in january 2015 we did it online we did it through the grassroots level consultations across the 6 lakhs villages and the 6000 blocks and 300 600 districts and 3000 urban local bodies all state government zonal level consultations national level consultations where there were question templates on which we wanted the participants to talk about and then we had expert level consultations has seen three reports first the committee which was there for evolution of the national education policy headed by the former cabinet secretary late tsr subramaniam not accepted by the government a ministry exercise some inputs into the draft national education policy not accepted by the government and finally the third committee where dr kaske kasturangan the chairman of isro the former chairman of isro and a space scientist and a padma vibhushan holder he headed that committee to which i was blessed to be a secretary to that committee having been in the ministry as an osd for the national education policy now these three committee reports and stakeholder consultations across all levels that happened with mps with government of india ministries with state governments with student associations teacher associations industry associations name it and the total volume of suggestions in my word it is one of the most humongous consultations ever to have taken place which is around 7 lakh suggestions received 5 lakhs before the committee report and 2 lakhs to the committee's report that is of the 2019 report which then formed into the national education policy of 66 pages a 484 page document which took into account 5 lakh suggestions and two committees before it and 2 lakh suggestions on that committee's report which finally crystallized into a crisp document of just about 66 pages while saying that there is also this realization that as a subject in the under the constitution of india education is a subject in the concurrent list and this factor makes it very critical that we have consultations with the state government consultations with the honorable members of the parliament representing those states and having done all this the process of bringing out a policy is a consensus building so that all of us as stakeholders agree to those recommendations but fully 
being seized of the fact that being a subject in the state list, it is quite possible that they do not adopt it in totality. And that is acceptable because in a federal structure, you must respect the, the, the let us say, the decision of a provincial government or a state government to say that we may not be able to implement many of these recommendations. If it is not coming for political reasons, but because of the lack of preparedness, because of the lack of the fact that the, the ecosystem is not enabling it, it is a fair enough thing. So therefore, today, three years down the line, it is very encouraging to see that many of the reforms, whatever you call it, the national education policy talked about four new curricula for school education, which is the curricular framework for foundational stage, the curricular framework for school education, the curricular framework for teacher education, and the curricular framework for adult education. Parallelly, Kerala state is also developing those curriculum. Fair enough. So there is no reason for us to really feel any angst about any government wanting to do it in their own way because we are living in a federal structure and this is something that is to be taken on board as respecting state aspirations. Now, having said that, there are some recommendations which are purely structural and some recommendations which are process oriented. Now, and it comes to academic programs, because we are talking about mobility of students across states, across countries and so on, it is very essential that we more or less, to a great extent, at least about 80%, follow the larger framework of the four-year undergraduate program. So in my coming talk now, I am trying to talk to you about what is this three-year, four-year undergraduate program that NEP talks about and how it is distinct and different from the four-year curriculum that the Kerala state has brought about. Now, when you look at NEP, and I'm sure all of you have read through it, in the very first chapter, we have articulated 22 cardinal principles. The reason why we wrote that out was only to ensure that there is a consistency in the recommendations. The policy looks at the entire sector of education, starting from age three, with a robust early childhood care and education program in a new curricular paradigm of the five plus three plus three plus four, as opposed to what we are currently doing, the 10 plus two, three system, right? So in the school, you have the 10 plus two, which is your 10 years of schooling and your plus two level. And that is the determining factor for your school education, which is only 10 plus two. Whereas here we are talking from age three onwards. And that is the first three to eight years is the foundational stage with early childhood care and education, the preparatory stage, eight to 11 years, the middle stage, 11 to 14 years, and the secondary stage from 14 to 18 years. I am a product of 11 plus four, not what bulk of you may be, where we did 11 years of schooling, first year and second year of your degree, of your first year of second year of your college and two years of your bachelor's degree, since I am also a non-technical graduate. So this is what we did. Then came the 10 plus two. And now we are talking about a paradigm shift of five plus three plus three plus four. But please understand the difference between these 10 plus two and the five plus three plus three plus four is not the physical restructuring of schools. It is only a change in the approach to the curricula and the pedagogy and the assessment. Why? Because there is empirical evidence supported by neurological neurological sciences that children learn in an age appropriate manner. It also supports the fact as a policy that we look at education as one organic continuum, that there is cross connections and interconnectedness among the sectors of education. Therefore, the quality of a higher education student is greatly impacted by the quality of the school education. And therefore, the strong linkages between school education and higher education needs to be understood. And as far as the student is concerned, 
the journey of that student is one single journey. It's a trajectory. It's a learning trajectory. You may have different administrative bodies to look at it. So for some, we may say a school and we say a college or a university. But as far as the student's learning journey is concerned, the student is going through it in a seamless manner. And that organic continuity in the learning continuum is very, very significant. So when we talked about the early childhood care and education, I'm talking about this particular point because I would like to bring to your attention the fact that many of us do not find good performers at higher stages of learning because of a learning deficit that was there right at the stage when they started their learning. And that is happening because 95% of our brain development, where the neural networks in our brain gets connected, does not happen when we are 20 or 21. It happens between the ages of zero to six. It's empirical, it's empirical scientific evidence. You look at a brain image, this is what we looked at. We saw two brain images taken through a scan, which shows a child who has not gone to a preschool kind of a thing and where the neural networks are not connected and someone who has had the neural networks connected. So what happens is when your neural networks are not connected, your assimilative ability to learn cannot happen. The ability to assimilate information, knowledge cannot take place. As a consequence, the learning does not happen in an effective manner. So realizing this, that zero to six is the critical stage. And since we are not able to handle the zero to three year olds who are so tender, we started from age three onwards, saying that three to eight is the foundational stage. And between three to six, we will not have formal learning at all. No pencil, no paper no slates, you only allow them to use play, play uh, toys and games, and you use the joy-based methods of learning, the play-way-based method of learning, or the activity-based methods of learning. Why? A child's curiosity at that stage is the maximum. Color, shapes, coordination, psychomotor development through playing sports and games. This is what needs to be developed. And a child who does not do that and who the bulk of the Indian children coming from a rural background and not so privileged as you and I are going to an Anganwadi system where their health and nutrition is definitely taken care of because you have a sizable improvement in the reduction rates of infant mortality and maternal mortality thanks to the vaccination, the, the, the calorific value of the food that we give, the iron and folic acid that we give to expectant mothers, all this has changed thanks to a, the largest integrated child development scheme that is running in the world. And all your polio vaccination, your BCG vaccination, that has taken care of the fact that both neonatal and prenatal deaths of children do not happen. But what suffers there through the Anganwadi system is the fact that even though you have about 12 lakh Anganwadi workers, whom we call over here, both Anganwadi and Asha workers being the same, these people are unable to devote their time for the education part of it. So those children going to an Anganwadi, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a student who goes through a preschool-based method of learning, you are creating a learning divide right at the start. So we said class one, we do not want up to age six, any formal learning, allow a child to join class one only at age six. And there is data to tell us which supports that the race for our understanding as parents who a precious year is lost. It is not lost because that child's subsequent learning will improve if that child is joining only at class one at age six. And that is what we have tried to emphasize. Now over here, what Kerala has said is that First, they said they insisted on age five. Subsequently, they said they leave it to the schools. So it's OK. It's flexible. Some schools are taking in at much later ages of age of beyond five. It's only a cutoff date. And the idea is that 
the later the child joins, provided there has been foundational learning, the better it is for that child's brain development, and therefore their assimilation gets better. Therefore, they learn more effectively. And world over, globally, they have, I would suggest over here, not because I contributed a chapter over there, the pencil power report, which is brought out by the Square Panda Foundation, headed by Andre Agassi, where clearly in my chapter, which is the impact of ECC on higher education, reduced crime rates, greater employability factors, better social accommodability of children and into their later lives. So the world over, the globe is investing more into very robust ECCE programs because it has much larger impact in the later learning years. And that is the idea where in the foundational stage, we are talking about the three to eight year olds having two aspects. One is a robust ECC. The second is the three R's of reading, writing, and arithmetic. The three R's which we call today as the foundational literacy and numeracy mission. The counting abilities, the numerical abilities. So the reason why many of us dislike mathematics is because someone as a child whose numerical abilities were never given a foundation can never understand mathematics at all. And mathematics is one subject which we all need to understand whether we like it or not, because it has ramifications for many other things in many other disciplines. It's our numerical abilities that is being done. So the simplest things we cannot do if you do not understand mathematics. So the foundational literacy and numeracy, because the maximum dropouts that happen in the schooling stage happens at class five. And that is because from class one to class five, the child has not understood anything that has happened in the class. Those children coming from an Anganwadi system whose brain development has not taken place, usually are simply sitting there in a class without understanding any fundamentals. And that is being addressed through a mission mode what we call the foundational literacy and numeracy mission. And this scheme will take care of addressing the remediation, the gap filling, the learning gap filling, the learning deficits in these three hours for such children whose abilities are not owned because of their learning deficit that they had in their initial stages through appropriate, let us say, activities and so on. Now, this part of the foundational stage is the most critical one and you actually initiate a child into formal learning from class one and class two and the preparatory stage where it still goes on to a higher level. What we are seeing as ramifications in higher education emanate from changes that we have suggested in the national education policy in the middle stage in class six and from class six. So all the CBSE affiliated schools in Kerala, all the ICSE affiliated schools in Kerala, I'm not too sure about state government run schools, have accepted that the hard distinctions we make between curricular, co-curricular, extracurricular is completely done away with. And that students can take up music, they will get marks and credits. They can play a sport, they will get credits. They want to do something of carpentry, they will get credits. They are good at dramatics, they will get credits. They learn any subject. They are not divided saying that this is curricular and therefore more cerebral and the rest is not cerebral because both the sides of the brain, the left and the right, equally are contributing to an individual's development. Therefore, all subjects, without demarcating curricular, co-curricular, extracurricular, art subjects, vocational subjects, academic subjects, science and commerce, without doing that, children may be allowed to choose subjects in various combinations, giving them curricular choices. The other change that comes about is the manner in which you will test the children and therefore the changes that happens because if you want children's curiosity, creativity, cognition abilities, their problem-solving skills, their spirit of inquiry, 
all these to be actually nurtured and cultivated. You cannot merely test them on the basis of memory. So memorization or road testing, where you completely suffocate students' creativity and ability to think independently has to be done away with because there is no real learning that happens. When a student memorizes something, he does it, he or she does it merely by a rigor of repetition. And that repetition gets stored in some part and it is subsequently regurgitated on an answer script. And subsequently, when asked, the student cannot recollect it because memory does not support for such a long time. And what really happens without understanding something when a student, but if you give them problem solving activities, if you give them projects, if you give them activities where they do by actually trying to understand a theory or a concept and then test them. So the testing will shift from road based. Obviously, the manner in which a teacher will teach has to be driven by activities has to be driven by an active learning environment in which children engage with other children, engage with teachers. So collaborative skills, developing their spirit of solving questions, not even if you had an open book exam, it would really not make a difference because the answer is not there in the book. The answer would be where the student applies what he or she has understood to answer a question. So the manner in which you teach will also undergo changes. So that change which we are introducing in class six and where we are also reducing the burden of examination. You must have read about it. The National Curriculum Framework for School Education released last Wednesday says that we will have two attempts to do board exams because examinations are almost becoming almost life threatening because children develop a fear for it. And the kind of markings that they do becomes even more enhanced. And those who are not cerebral by nature, they have a tendency to think that they are of no value and therefore take extreme steps, like even ending their lives before a board result is brought out. So that whole thing to reduce that strain and the new curriculum framework talks about various options that student can take at classes 10 and classes 12. And all this will have weightage for your entrance examinations to engineering and professional degrees that and also that they would offer it in different regional languages has completely changed the manner in which you add to the goals of access and equity within education access and equity is not just in terms of the rural and the urban access and equity should also be to create enablers for all children to be able to thrive in an educational system this is what has gone into the higher education under the national education policy of the flexible three-year, four-year undergraduate program. So let me first talk to you about the NEP1 before talking to you about the changes with the curricular framework of Kerala. So here in the NEP, we are saying that all undergraduate degrees will no longer be Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Commerce, Bachelor of Engineering, B.Tech, B.Farm, LLB, B.Ed and so on. You can take it up as saying bachelors in parenthesis or in bracket, wherever you have majored in can come into brackets. But the degree would be a multidisciplinary degree and you will allow students to choose a combination of courses as wide as maybe taking mechanical engineering with music or pharmacy with agriculture or sociology with mathematics in any combination. What is limiting is the fact that an institution may not offer all these disciplines. We are all either art, science, commerce colleges or engineering colleges or medical colleges or pharmacy colleges or management colleges or commerce colleges and so on. So we are going to say that all students should be given these options. Obviously, even if India has 1000 plus universities and 40,000 affiliated colleges, 
we may not be able to say that all this thousand plus and forty thousand affiliated colleges will offer all these courses. Neither should it be done. You should never think in terms of homogenization. Homogenization is a very dangerous word when it comes to education system. It will defeat the idea of flexibility. So what you are saying is, you will allow them to choose from a bouquet of courses. And these are not confined to your own disciplinary areas. You allow them to choose, say, your own college, I assume is an art, science, and commerce college. And if it is an art, science, and commerce college, and students were taking, let us say, economics, but they want to learn, let us say, languages, or they want to learn accountancy, then, or they want to learn physics, you should be able to allow them to take in that combination. Now, beyond that, if a student wants to take up engineering as one of the subjects or pharmacy or law or agriculture, we are saying that higher education institutions will enter into a clustering arrangement with other institutions where a memorandum of understanding or an MOU is signed between a number of institutions in a given geographical vicinity to say that we will allow students taking admissions into, let us say, the Bishop College to take up courses of engineering or music or agriculture from this many number of co colleges. That is an arrangement which will have a joint committee for fees, a joint committee for the timetable, so as to ensure that no student is wasting their time because of that kind of offering or no faculty is sitting idle because of one set of students having gone to another college. So you are allowing multiple sets of choices to the students because of the idea that we need to move towards multidisciplinary. I don't have to re-emphasize why we need to move towards multidisciplinarity. Now, this flexibility is allowing for, in the LEP guidelines, 40 credits per year and a three-year program is 120 credits and a four-year program is 160 credits. We in the NEP say the 120 credits is the minimum threshold, 10% additional credits if a student has erroneously or inadvertently made a wrong choice. So that leeway of additional 10% credits of 120 to become 132 or 160 to become 176. Now, this 40 credits that we are talking of in the NEP, in the Kerala state, the three-year program is 133 credits and the four-year program is 177 credits. But the structure of the course is more or less, irrespective of the number of credits, is that there will be common courses. These common courses are what we call communication skills, digital skills, learning about the constitution, the Indian values, the environment, gender. These are collaborative skills or the 21st century skills, research skills. These are all common courses. They have credits for all of them, but you need not assign separate class periods for them because they can be woven into the discipline that you teach. I don't have to have a separate class for digital skills in sociology. But I will weave that digital skills, even if it is a one credit course, within the subject of sociology or within the subject of English literature to teach a student how you hone or how you use technology. So the common courses is there in NEP, it is there over here also. Then you come to the core disciplinary areas, which is where the student will be making a choice as to where they would like to major and get their maximum credits so that they are majoring into a particular discipline. Now, that core discipline areas is in multiple disciplines as available in the institutions, the single institution or in multiple sets of institutions. Then you have the multidisciplinary courses, which is other than the core discipline, what are you taking in other discipline areas? Now here, these multidisciplinary courses, like I said, you are allowing sociology with, let us say, mechanical engineering 
or if you are talking of your own college you are saying sociology along with accountancy or sociology along with physics this combination that you are allowing is the multidisciplinary courses the core discipline being sociology in addition to this we are talking about skill enhancement courses value added courses so ability enhancement course ability enhancement courses are purely language skills so if they are not part of your common courses you can have your ability enhancement courses as being separate for language skills then you have skill enhancement courses and you have value added courses now as i said nep says that and i think even the kerala higher education curriculum framework cannot uh, uh, not follow ugc guidelines we have said that in the degree program whether it is 120 credits or 160 credits 40% of the credits can be acquired through moocs or odl courses and i think that same guidelines would apply here too because that is something that the ugc has stated and i don't think universities in kerala can afford not to accept that so the 40% credits that we are saying suppose the student wants to take up let us say learning a spanish language and it's not there in any of the colleges around then that student is free to do it from an open university or from a moocs course but moocs is not udemy or not coursera or not edx but only swayam platform which is the government of india platform for the moocs courses so all moocs courses when a student completes that the assumption is that the all requirements of internal assessment and all requirements of examinations have been complied with and the credits are given to the student dinda ye akima ad parnu irikkunne i kindly request aparna hari kumar to mute sorry ma'am sorry for the interruption sorry ma'am shakila ma'am you are muted kindly unmute okay am i audible now yeah so when you allow this kind of combinations of allowing multidisciplinary core discipline common courses ability enhancement skill enhancement and value added as a faculty please don't get alarmed because you are not actually having an addition to your workload except that the classification of those courses have got changed and certain part of this is not there as different class periods but are woven into your own basic discipline that you teach and under the kerala framework you are slightly having less challenges because you are not offering multiple entry and exit in the first year and the second year exit is only in the third year whereas under what we said under the nep we are allowing for exit at every year at every year a student has the flexibility to exit but please understand both kerala and the national education policy have clearly said that all undergraduate students irrespective of which discipline they pursue will mandatorily undergo an internship program so if it is a technical subject it is an apprenticeship and if it is a non technical subject it is an internship project now this internship is very critical because the bulk of the criticism that comes from our of our graduate students is that they do not have what we call the employability skills when they complete a degree and they go out they do not know how to face an interview they do not know how to communicate effectively they are not having how to participate in a group discussion they do not have collaborative skills of teamwork and so on so when you have an internship project it is basically to bridge the gap between the world of education and the world of work now as in nep since we are allowing exit at the end of every year any student wanting to exit and get a certification it is mandatory for that student to complete that internship within that year so even if it is the first year that person can get a certificate at the end of first year and if that certificate can be given only if the student has completed an internship project provided 
he is exiting at that stage if he is not exiting the student can complete as and when the degree is chosen to be completed so first year certificate second year diploma does not apply to kerala we come to the third year so the flexibility that we are talking of is flexibility in choice of subjects flexibility to do it across institutions and transfer academic credits flexibility to also take up of open and distance so the mode of learning and flexibility as we say multiple entry and exit to exit at every year whereas here multiple entry and exit comes into into implementation only in the in the year 3 so kerala is starting to implement it from 2024 so the 2024 student will have no option to exit in 2025 or in 2026 you are seeing a bachelor's degree student exiting with a degree only in 2027 or a degree student going to the four years and exiting at the end of the four years doing a four year of bachelor's irrespective of whether it is an arts science or commerce or the so called non the general programs which are non professional in nature now here the third year we are and we, even in the kerala framework the character of the program remains the same where we say that more than 50% credits must be in your core major disciplines so as to get a bachelor's with majoring in a given subject and that is a option where in the kerala framework the student can exit with a 3 year degree now that student even in the kerala framework will have to do in the future a 2 years masters which is not the same masters that you are currently offering because your masters even now is not interdisciplinary or allowing students to take up in multiple disciplinary areas which means the curricula will have to be changed accordingly now fourth year the kerala framework is talking about capstone subjects which is somewhat like what we are saying in our nep that we are talking about two types of the four year bachelor's degree one is with two majors where in your seventh and eighth semester you are continuing with your regular undergraduate teaching and learning process or you are doing a bachelor's with research and such a student who is doing it with research seventh and eighth semester you are doing a research project and you are going to submit something like a dissertation at the end of the fourth year that student under the nep is not required to do a masters program at all so under the nep we have three options a student exits the three year bachelors gets a degree and is free to exit the bachelors completely whenever the student wants to do a masters that student will have to do a two years of masters the other option is that you have a four year bachelors and which is the same which we are saying bachelors with honors under the nep and here we are saying bachelors with honors again with capstone subjects that student is having a four year of bachelors as per the nep and i'm sure as per the kerala framework also we will have to do only a one year of masters but the nep offers the third option of bachelors with research and exempting that student completely from a masters to go in for the phd program now in these three options when you say exit the question will be when do i get a chance to come back and complete you are saying exit and entry so 7 years is the maximum period within which a student can exit and come back such in such a manner suppose in the kerala framework a student takes an exit in 3 years but subsequently says no my degree is not complete i want to do the fourth year then that student has to come back in such a manner to complete it within that window of 7 years now all the credits of students in such a combination of courses cannot be physically maintained and the data cannot be physically maintained and that is why a digital storage of academic credits called the academic bank of credit has been created by the nep the state government also says that they will onboard onto the abc they have technicalities because under kerala different universities there is a kerala technical university 
then you have your state other university agriculture university is different so in that the mobility of credits is something that has some technical issues and given that once the technicalities are solved then they may be able to onboard on to the abc but right now they have clearly said in the four year undergraduate program that among the universities credit mobility will be allowed and the academic bank of credit will be operational so within the state the abc is becoming operational but it is not getting onboarded onto the national abc because of the internal technicalities where universities are having disciplinary boundaries the ktu is taking care of the entire technical education which is not the case you come under kerala university or mg university depending on the geographical jurisdiction of that university then you have an agriculture university then you have an oceans and fisheries university so you have here the discipline segregated universities which makes it difficult to have the mobility of credits once that is sorted out then they would on board on to the abc is what i understand reading between the lines of the kerala framework because they accept in principle the need for credit mobility and the seamless transition of academic credits so that a student going from here to another state should be able to get the benefit of the credits earned here when studying in maharashtra or in delhi or in any other part of india you cannot therefore restrain that and put your students at a disadvantage now as far as the nep is concerned the one one is the instrumentality of the abc two other documents are very important one is the national higher education qualification framework and the national credit framework what is the function of nheqf when you say that a student is allowed to move from one university or one college to another college without being asked to repeat what the student has covered in the first year or the second year you must establish an equivalence of the syllabus that is covered so the nheqf broadly draws an equivalence of the course content covered in various disciplines so that when a student moves from one year to another year in another institution almost 80% of that course content has is similar and has been covered therefore the credits that are earned can be redeemed by the student in the new institution without having to repeat it once again because if you ask a student to repeat it then your entire credit combinations can go haywire and that student will be doing much more number of credits now even the fee structure we have said that students can take on additional courses and therefore in such cases we will charge them not course wise fees but credit based fees so breaking up college fees as per credits is the next step that would come into being so that you actually make students understand that it is all students now are taking a similar set of courses so you can have a common fee structure but that is not the case when you allow multiple choices where students may be taking different sets of credits that is why the fees will have to be demarcated as per credits rather than as per courses now <coughs> two other points when we are talking of this new flexible framework this is as i said made multidisciplinary because the character of knowledge and the type of graduates we are looking at with multiple competencies not i shaped graduates but t shaped graduates disruptive technologies challenging job so multiple skills and multiple competencies children should have communicative skills collaborative skills problem solving abilities working together as a team and all these factors come into the picture and when you talk in terms of activities you the kind of activities that the student do it can be projects it can be working in a uh, on the field working taking up a studio project working in actual community all these social engagement and all that these are all seen so when the teaching load is calculated because many faculty are asking us this question that we have faculty and the number of minors and majors you see there are less faculty for a larger option of students and more faculty for a lesser option of students 
will that larger number of faculty be thrown out of jobs? No, because here we are talking in terms of workload being calculated, not just the teaching hours, but all these activities like group work and communicate the kind of remediation programs, the tutorials that you may be offering, the skill based activities that are given, projects that students do, all these have to be calculated when taking the workload. So the Kerala framework clearly tells you what is a credit for a student and what is the credit that a teacher is getting in terms of the time input because credit is ultimately the time input that you're putting in. So the number of hours that a student puts it when he earns a credit and the number of hours that a teacher puts it when a credit is given, the two are actually mapped in a manner that you may not have this issue of teachers workload being disproportionate or not being uh, uh, commensurate. Therefore, the likelihood of jobs going away that I think it has been taken care of in the framework. Now the NEP talks when it says holistic development. It is important for us to understand that you allow for all other aspects that contribute to holistic development. By that I mean that you must provide for opportunities for debating, dramatics, poetry, music, sports, all of them. Now Kerala does not have really much issues here because Kerala is known to have cultural youth festivals right from schools and into your colleges and universities. So children have a lot of opportunities to showcase their talent in other areas by which you can say you're contributing or helping them to contribute to the holistic development. New developments that come over there are the eco clubs, the techno clubs, the environment clubs. These are some of the new areas, the new emerging areas that you may have to set up or create. But more important is the well-being of the student, the psychological well-being of the student. There is a crisis that is happening, not only in Kerala, but everywhere, that the child who is born in the 21st century with the mobile, and who is so adept at using that technology has unfortunately become very isolated from other students, from family and from the society itself. And they're all forms of entertainment is all in a virtual world of Facebook or Instagram or TikTok and name it, whatever you have. So they're feeling that friends exist with the number of likes that they get on Instagram or Facebook does not help them cope with various areas of stress and emotional problems that they face. This has resulted in two deviant behaviors. One, very sad, where students snuff out their lives for the flimsiest of reasons. The other, where you see people moving towards substance and drug abuse. Therefore, it is a responsibility of an education system, both in school and in higher education, to take care of the socio-emotional well-being of students. So psychological counseling is equally important as much as academic counseling and career counseling. And promoting their health and well-being through physical education and sports, because we go by the adage that a healthy mind resides in a healthy body. And all these deviant behavior to a great extent are channelized when physical energy is channelized in a proper manner. So this part calls for faculty and I come to that when I come to the role of the faculty to address this major crisis that is happening in our young population. And if you go by what I said at the beginning, that if they don't become productive individuals, but they turn to drugs and substance abuse and so on, they will not be part of that productive population. They would only be the dependent population and their lifespans itself would not extend somewhere beyond the mid twenties or the early thirties if they went into this kind of behavior. Now, therefore, the role of the faculty while talking about all these changes, the role of the faculty becomes even more challenging and we need to completely transform from our traditional manners to new ways in which we become relevant. As I said at the beginning, if you don't want to be the dinosaur in the classroom, then you must adapt to this new changing scenarios. The nature of the student 
as distinct from you is that you do not use technology the way you, they use. And therefore, earlier, the role of a teacher was that of an information giver. Today, they don't need a teacher to get information. At the tip of a finger, they are able to get that through their smartphones. And they don't really need that. Then your question would be, then what am I there as a teacher for? Drawing the connections, helping the learners to learn in a more effective manner. The mantra today is learning how to learn. And you are there as a facilitator, as an enabler, as someone who guides and mentors the student, someone who makes a student feel that he or she is valued and understanding the potential. That is where the group activities become very important and creating from passive classroom learn teaching methods to creating active learning classrooms. What do I mean by active learning classrooms? Adopt flipped classroom tech methods. Give the students that this is what we are going to discuss. Can you imagine the torture of a student? I don't know about the classroom timings over here, but when I taught in Bombay University, my first class was at 6.50. And I had my last class somewhere ending at around 12.15. In this time, I am going on attending different undergraduate degree classes and teaching them various subjects of political science and psychology and so on, which were my majors and my minors. And imagine the fate of the student. Shakila comes and takes a class. Kavita comes and takes another class. They don't talk at all. They are passively listening for almost about six hours where they are contributing nothing except that they are supposed to be receiving something. The student of today whose attention span can never be of that long and who needs something for information they are not there. They are there to understand how to understand the connections among various concepts and theories, how to solve problems. How do I improve my cognitive abilities? How do I improve my problem solving ability? How do I do logical thinking? How do I have analytical reasoning? How do I develop my collaborative skills? How do I develop my coordination abilities? All this, including time management, handling stress, these are all needed. So the role of a teacher has completely changed. Please understand, as I said, you were born after 2000. You were born before 2001. All the students are born after 2001. This gap, you must understand. And you must be sensitive to the fact that if you have to be relevant, engage that student in the class. Give them problem solving activities. Put them into a group. What will happen is that a lower level learning skill ability student, along with a higher order learning ability student, when they come together, there is a neutralization effect. The, learn, the slow learner learns from the more intelligent. And when you ask them to form themselves into group, someone whose communication ability is better comes up with presentation. Someone whose content part of it is stronger, they come together. So what happens is everyone's potential gets utilized. And you also get to gauge what are the strengths and the weaknesses of your student. So give activities which involve group discussions, make them go out into a field and understand something. The best example that I can give for doing an actual internship is the usage of the library. In a age of technology where students no longer read actual books, but they read only on their mobiles, give them projects which forcibly makes them visit the library and tell them to make an assessment. You and I went through the reference indexes by name order, by, by the title of the book, or by the dual decimal classification codes. These students do not do that at all. And you can you have to be the motivator to do make them to do that because they need to understand the value of understanding how to use a library. Other things, many other areas, let us be innovative in the way we start engaging with the students. So the student in that way, engages with the curricula, engages with his fellow learners, engages with the teacher, and all this happening in an active, vibrant classroom where they are not passive, but they are contributing, and you are yourself 
at the highest level going to become like a co-learner because you shed your academic ego that I know all and you also need to understand that you also learn along with them. Therefore, as a teacher, the role of the faculty, we wrote that chapter with a title, Energized, Motivated and Capable Faculty. That is the title of the chapter, that we need to energize, motivate and make our faculty capable while intrinsically recognizing that the major catalyst for all this change is the faculty. No change can happen unless faculty change, which means that when I say multidisciplinary, the subject that I teach, let us not sit with this idea that holier than thou is my subject and that other disciplines, I do not talk to them at all. You need to start interacting as a faculty with faculty teaching other disciplines, working out how we make new combinations. And that is when you actually start becoming multidisciplinary in your own approach. So if you have to have students becoming multidisciplinary, the faculty need to embrace multidisciplinarity itself. And we should start talking to our colleagues in other departments, in other institutions, start collaborating with them. And most importantly, nurturing research at undergraduate level. India fares abysmally poor in the global rankings of universities, be it the Times ranking, be it the QS rankings, be it the Shanghai rankings. Now, all these rankings put a high premium on research. And here in undergraduate education, our thrust is completely on teaching and not on research. But I think all of us here will agree that teaching and research are like two sides of the same coin. We are good researchers, acquired our, did some research program, completed a doctoral study, which enabled us to become a faculty. Then do we forget about our research altogether? No, you are expected to nurture that into the undergraduate students. So for this, the whole idea and many people over here were very apprehensive that the creation of the National Research Foundation would actually bring out a centralized single window for clearing research projects. The number of students in higher education today are 37.5 million students. Do you think any organization, if it is reading through a research proposal, can be a single window clearance for research proposals? NRF is only supposed to focus on additional funding over and above ICSSR funding, CSIR funding, DBT funding, DST funding, all other councils that take care of research funding over and above the UGC and AICT, whatever research fundings that come and bring about an ecosystem of research where industry, academia and research laboratories are networked to basically seed and nurture research at undergraduate levels. The whole idea is that more funding for research, not just the 0.8% that we spend today, has to go up substantially. And research does not happen like lighting a bulb. You have to actually nurture research skills, ask students to identify a problem, find out the methodologies and the tools to collect data then analyze that data and the statistical methods for that. So if you start doing that, what really will happen is that we will actually be creating more knowledge. Knowledge generation, that is what research is. The function of higher education, knowledge dissemination and knowledge generation or knowledge production. Knowledge dissemination we do very effectively in teaching, but knowledge production and creating more research papers, more patents, more publications. These are to come in through knowledge production. So that we need to. And the third dimension, of course, is community and social engagement. This is equally important in the 21st century. As I said, right at the beginning, the community connect that higher education institutions or universities are areas that help individuals not only really contribute to their own individual growth, but to improve the quality of life of people living around them. Now, the NEP 2020 also emphasizes the need for integration and broadening 
and reimagining what we call is vocational education. So the skill-based higher education, and I'm happy that when I look at the kind of BVOC options that are offered by the various universities, I can see that it is there in agribusiness, in fashion technology, in fish farming and aquaculture, in logistics and supply management, in blockchain management, all these are new and emerging areas. So our traditional mindset that when you look at skilling, it is only plumbing and so on, is completely different. While plumbing and carpentry and electrical um, and electrical electricians, they are all equally important. The modernization of those laboratories that handle that because we have moved digital to all this. And therefore, that kind of changes also have to come about. But the national credit framework, I mentioned to you about this instrumentality, the in national credit framework ensures the kind of mobility that we have from ITIs and polytechnics into the mainstream education, giving them also that benefit of lateral entry and exit. And the levels are calculated accordingly. So the credit framework is something that will have international ramifications because when you go to a degree or undergo a program outside and you say that this is the credit that I have acquired, it makes sense to a person in a foreign country or a foreign university. Okay, this is what they've done. This is the share of the skill part that they've done. This is the part of the mainstream higher education. This is the area that they major in so that you promote by the national credit framework, the mobility of students, not only within this country, but outside this country too. Similarly, as a quantitative target, we have said that we will reach 50% GER by about 2035. Currently, as per the All India Survey of Higher Education, that is of 2020-21, the higher education GER calculated for students in the age group of 18 to 23 in ratio to the proportion of population in that age group is 27.1, which translates in absolute numbers to 37.5 million students. When you say you want to reach 50% by 2035, it actually effectively means that you need to reach something like 75 million students, which is a very tall order to achieve. Now, if you need to reach that, you need to accept that some share of that will come in through open and distance learning. You cannot have brick and mortar education, neither can India afford to keep setting up new universities in brick and mortar. So the acceptance that open and distance learning will also be a substantial contributor to the GER ratio within this country calls for a complete revamp in the quality assurance of open and distance learning programs. So accreditation, having quality assurance standards, benchmarking that, ensuring that the same face-to-face -face education and the open and distance learning are at par. Unless we do that, we are at a serious threat of saying that ODL remains secondary to mainstream education. So Kerala also has a state open university. And it is important that the quality benchmarks of SNOU also are equally maintained, which is what they will also have to go through the accreditation process. So both vocational education and open and distance learning come in for a substantial recognition, exp expansion, and quality metrics so as to ensure the quality of both skill-based education and open and distance learning. The NEP also talks in terms of internationalization of higher education. And this is something that I think yeah, even in Kerala, there is a realization that Kerala could become a hub for students from maybe those coming in from the West Asia, Middle East, African countries. But also that we can, just as we are seeing in the labor force, a lot of migrants coming in from other states within the country. On one side, you are having a depletion of numbers where our students for undergraduate studies are going abroad. Can we think of a model taking into account what the NEP says of internationalization of higher education and dual degrees and so on? That is with foreign universities, the same trend to accept offering dual degrees even here. 
not only in collaboration. So there are two things that can happen. As far as internationalization, we are saying student mobility, where we allow student exchange programs, currently also ongoing. We are only saying let's enhance the numbers. Faculty mobility, faculty exchange programs, collaborative research between faculty of universities already being done and being permitted. Even yeah, under the KTU, I have seen that they are allowing for that kind of collaboration. But what is important is the joint degrees, the dual degrees, and the twinning programs. Here you are seeing a brain drain of students leaving right at their undergraduate education to foreign countries. Can we start offering degrees in collaboration with foreign universities? So here again, I, I understand that because the jurisdiction is geographical within the state and technical subjects are not offered by general universities, there are some technical problems that arise for dual degrees, joint degrees and twinning programs. But leaving aside those areas, let us say MG University wants to collaborate with, let us say, a university in Australia or UK or US or maybe Singapore or Hong Kong for joint degrees in similar areas. So the regulations go like this. If it is training programs, there is not much change. It is that the student does maybe one semester in a foreign university and that student decides at the time of taking admission that this is a program which is having a twinning arrangement and one semester I'm doing it there. But for joint degrees and dual degrees, there is a minimum requirement that both the universities right at the beginning specify the minimum number of credits that they will offer in both these programs. And they are therefore at the initial stage itself, a credit arrangement for getting a joint degree signed by both the universities and a dual degree where that second degree must be in an allied area and not very different. So let us say you're learning business economics and you want to do, let us say, computational accounting. Then the two seem to be like allied degrees. So dual degrees will allow for two degrees in allied areas being given to a student. Now we need to think whether we can start doing this kind. So at one side, it will be able to, to some extent, limit the kind of migration of our students from the higher education in our state. The other important aspect also is that the credit mobility that they get helps them when they go in for much further studies, but they will feel attracted to still come back over here. But for the faculty, more important is the collaborative research. So the research and taking up international collaborative research projects is something that you should be able to leverage because it is there under NEP and there is nothing from the Kerala government which says that this cannot be done. Rather, I have seen that they are actually signing MOUs, but we do not do it at individual institution level. If an MOU is signed by the Kerala government, then I think it is possible that it applies to all the universities to take benefit of this. It's a bilateral MOU. When it's a bilateral MOU between two countries, then it goes without saying that education projects and education research, including undergraduate degrees, can all be part of that arrangement. So both KTU and the Kerala government, I have seen, have signed a number of MOUs, and I think you can take advantage of internationalization of higher education. Now, two or three other points before I stop and put it up for interaction. One is this idea of equity and inclusion. And we were accused a lot of not having talked about reservation in the policy. Now, for someone who has been an education policy, 1968 policy, 1986 policy, you will never find the word reservation. See, reservation is not done by education policies. Reservation is mandated by the constitution of this country. And no power in this country can go ultra wires the power of the constitution. So what is mandated in the constitution, whether it is for the SCs, the STs, for those with disabilities, for the OBCs, which we did in 2006, is something that the constitution stipulates. So 
the policy may not talk of reservation but it talks about interventions and specific strategies to enhance the participation of the so called educationally disadvantaged groups now 86 and 68 policy had small paragraphs education of scs education of sts education of minorities education of girls education of poor students education of children with disabilities and so on both 68 and 86 policy this was the nomenclature that was followed what we did in the nep 2020 is we created an omnibus term where we said that they are socially and economically disadvantaged groups as an omnibus term to represent scs sts obcs minorities both linguistic and religious people living in geographically inaccessible areas in hilly terrain coming from absolutely tribal areas those girls transgenders children with disabilities physical disabilities or learning disabilities children of migrant population vulnerable sections and the urban poor this entire categorization or different categories of what we say are socially and economically disadvantaged groups have been given an omnibus term to then say that we will provide specific interventions what are those specific interventions we said that wherever the ger is lesser than the national average we will provide or call them as special education zones they may be populated with more number of scs or more number of sts or more number of minorities or linguistic minorities or religious minorities or obcs you provide them as special education zones with more funding that is being given to them other is the gender inclusion fund and the social inclusion fund but a game changer in higher education and of course there are other interventions we talked about that we should have more scholarships study room facilities hostel facilities learning resources learning aids being given books and transportation and so on because it applies chapter 6 and chapter 14 both look at school education and higher education but in higher education a major change that is supposed to enhance access and equity in higher education is that we will offer higher education in regional languages or bilingual bilingual degrees that is two reasons unlike the european world where only one language is spoken india is home to nearly somewhat like 120 languages in terms of dialects we are almost about 200 odd dialects where there is no script but there is spoken languages now other than the 22 languages listed in the eighth schedule of the indian constitution india is home to so many languages now many people who are coming into higher education are those who are coming from what we may call a well to do segment of the society it has still remained elitist because it is an english speaking class of people the bulk of india is an living in the rural areas and largely coming from an agrarian population this agrarian population student <coughs> does not develop the courage and the confidence having studied in a vernacular or regional language background to join higher education which is offered only in english one data that you must understand nowhere in the world you have first generation learners when you say first generation learner that no one in their family earlier ever went to a school and they are the first to go for schooling and india has a diverse classroom a diversity in the classroom where you have first generation learners now these first generation learners are the ones who have broken out of their mold and come into higher education but should we not create enablers for those who do not want to pursue it in a language to which they are not familiar to allow it in regional languages therefore we have provided that and i think you are all aware that all entrance examinations today are being offered in multiple languages so entrance exam to engineering 
entrance exam to medical exam uh, entrance examination cuet they are being offered in 8 to 10 regional languages others will be get added on and in order to facilitate that literature and relevant reference material and reading books are being provided you have a mission which is taking care of two aspects of translating these materials and also creating abilities for interpreting these languages through audio books and so on. So a um, mission mode is being taken care so as to enhance access of such people coming from rural background who wish to pursue higher education. It is aspirational. Let us not deny that. Higher education is an aspiration, but they don't join because they are completely scared that they are not able to cope with the language which they have not learned or they were learning it only as a second language or a third language and cannot study all subjects in a given language. So to facilitate that as an equity measure, we are allowing that. Of course, it requires teachers to develop bilingual abilities. Many of us have that, but we have not started utilizing that. And for the reading material, we are saying that this translation and allowing entrance examinations is also one facilitating role that has been accepted by the national testing agency and we are offering it in regional languages now the other two dimensions that i would like to talk is while i talked about research you also need to develop entrepreneurial skills in our youngsters so i talked about skill education and entrepreneurial education, we don't want all our graduates to be job seekers. They can be job creators, as we say, so they can be encouraged. Educational institutions should set up industry academia cells, incubation centers, innovation centers, so that you develop entrepreneurial skills and new startups and so on can be created by the students. And our students have the potential. Please understand an 18 year old exercises the right of suffrage and the right to vote and determine the government of the day that student should be credited with some degree of self-esteem and focus in life all that they need is the kind of enablers the motivation that needs to come in from the institution from the us as faculty and from an ecosystem that encourages them to do that so entrepreneurial education and nurturing innovation through innovation clubs to hackathons, all this where independent thinking is nurtured in children is something that we are focusing on. <coughs> Technology in education. When COVID came, actually we were in the business of writing the policy in the month of March when the lockdown happened. We wrote one chapter, chapter 23, but we wrote chapter 24 after COVID came into existence because of the realization that the way forward is not just face-to-face -face learning, but it is possible that we need to have online learning and hybrid models. The fact that we are sitting here today in this manner is because of our embracing technology. And we must not shirk from realizing that technology has its advantages, both for the students and for the teachers. Why for the students? Because as I told you right at the beginning, we, they are living in a world of disruptive technologies. And they are using platforms like ChatGPT for writing their assignments. You as teachers will not be aware of the ingenuity of our students, engineering students, if an assignment is given, that assignment question is posed to the chat GPT. The chat GPT throws out in machine language an answer. Will be identical. If there are 100 students in a class, 100 answers would be identical. Then what does that engineering student do? He applies the anti-plagiarism software. And each student will have a different answer. And maybe 10% is what the human intelligence works so that that answer doesn't look identical. You must accept that that is a power of technology today. So when students use this, both factors are important. 
it is an advantage because it helps us to generate so much of data so much of information which if we were to do manually would have taken quite a long time when you look at major algorithms that are taking place but the disadvantage is that will human intelligence become subservient to machine intelligence and i often quote frankenstein over here as a monster created by the human being but we should never allow that machine intelligence to overpower human intelligence and as an ultimate optimist no matter what science fiction films you watch all science fiction films show the success of the human intelligence because that is when that creation will survive so in that context when we accept the disruptive technologies it is challenging jobs we need to make our children use those technology they should know how to use machine learning robotics all today you have drone cameras being there all over the place why do you use that because it has its own advantages a large group you want to get an aerial view you have it being commonly used it is used across in all the sectors be it in media be it in films be it in news coverages in any field and so also in highly niche areas like we have the space launches we have the robotic surgery we are right now in a state of real let us say uh, absolute sense of wonder of our chandrayaan being there on the moon and an achievement that makes us all proud now that is all because of technology and we must be we must realize that human brain is capable of creating all these technologies for the betterment and always as a harmonizing force and not as a destructive force that is the ultimate part of it you can use it for destruction but you are always thinking of it more for harmonizing for universalizing for having benefits to the society for improving the quality of life and so on not for destruction and same way when we use technology in a teaching learning environment it is for enhancing the learning experiences so when children are given activities so when i said that you have skill based courses and digital skills you need to ask teachers empower yourselves through training and capacity building which is essential so that faculty start using those technology but definitely the quality of learning is no longer only by face to face learning but hybrid models that we were forced to use in an accelerated manner during covid but which is now becoming the reality today that we move towards online and hybrid models of learning so in your own course think of some activities which need not be done by the students in a hand written manner but in a using a technology if it is more technical obviously there are many other things that can be done but even for arts commerce or science subjects you can think of using digital kind of problem solving skills and here please accept that we may not be as knowledgeable as much as our students therefore this is where you are someone who becomes like a co learner with the student in using their skills which is more advanced than maybe you in using that technology technology for data management technology for administrative part of it and erp solutions networking library networking institutional networking all this is possible because of technology but it needs capacity building and training and i think most important the training of faculty because unless capacity building and continuous professional development of faculty happen it is not possible for bringing about these transformation it sounds very easy as we speak but they are very difficult when they go to be implemented on ground so the idea that technology has to be used for education and the whole changes that we are seeing makes it inevitable that we move towards that now a couple of areas that i didn't touch but in all probability will come up as questions in the interaction session is the aspects relating to accreditation and quality assurance currently you have nac accrediting you all and nba accrediting technical institutions one is an institutional accreditation by nac 
and one is a program based accreditation by nba we have suggested in the national education policy a massive change in the manner of accreditation there are only two countries in this world which follow accreditation the manner we do it and that's india and pakistan world over institutions are either accredited it's only binary yes or no you only put those two parameters it is either accredited it meets certain benchmark either it is not accredited now you have a draft guidelines for bringing about transformations in accreditation it is there on the ministry's website the last date for receiving public comments got over on 15th of august but that document reflects this idea that by december most probably they will bring in and kick in this new kind of an accreditation system where the gradings will go away and a system of binary accreditation of an institution being either accredited or not accredited will come into place on the regulation the nep recommended that the four functions of regulation funding accreditation and academic standard setting right now combined in together and therefore a concentration of four powers and conflicts between these in the ugc or the aict and the 17 professional councils may be rationalized through a light but tight mechanism of regulation by creating an umbrella body of the higher education commission of india wherein ugc aict nct and all the professional bodies given their regulatory powers to this new commission and the four functions are distinctly separate of regulation through the nhrc accreditation to the national accreditation council um, funding through the higher education grants commission and professional standard bodies and the general education council for academic standard setting going by the theory that separation of powers is always better administration on the governance part of it and as an institution a very important instrument that higher education colleges and universities must prepare is an institutional development plan so even your college can think of preparing an idp which is nothing but a strategic plan of action we have in the nep said that affiliation as a system should gradually be phased out to become what we call degree granting autonomous colleges that is not to say that the 40000 affiliated colleges will become degree granting universities but we are only trying to say that these 40000 colleges some of them who are colleges with potential for excellence some of them who are already autonomous college can become what we call autonomous degree granting colleges over a long period of 15 years where hand holding by their host university by the state government and meeting certain benchmarks and standards for getting graded accreditation they are able to gradually become autonomous from their host university it's a long dream and i think we need to work towards that but the instrument to achieve that is the institutional development plan so overall <clears throat> the national education policy now accepted to a great extent by the kerala through the four year undergraduate program provides a very enabling environment and an ecosystem to empower our students with the right kind of knowledge skills and capacities by which they can become future ready to meet with the challenges of what we call the 21st century society and for that as faculty we need to be able to accept those changes feel invested in those changes so that you become relevant rather than become an extinct species not relevant in the teaching environment i think i must have been able to cover a substantial part of it and i am sure that in the interaction that we have many of your other unanswered areas could get answered i thank again the organizers for giving me an opportunity let me also wish you all in advance for a happy onam a festival that all of us look forward to and the spirit of joy that it brings and i am now closing my talk now and keeping it open through kavita for interaction thank you very much thank you very much ma'am that was really a sequential and elaborative and authentic sharing of your insights thank you so much 
now the floor is open for the discussion. Uh, the participants may kindly uh, press on the raise hand button or else you can put your queries in the chat box. Ebi, sir. Ma'am, a wonderful session, but I have some concerns. Uh, you have mentioned about this five plus three four plus four polling system uh, at the national level, or uh, that is recommended by NEP. In Kerala, we have not changed our uh, system. And we are trying to implement the re reforms in uh, higher education institutions. My doubt is, as we have not started these reforms uh, in the at the school level, the students will not be aware about the changes in system. Hence, uh, a confusion may arise in the minds of the students and also in the minds of the parents that which program they should choose in their undergraduation level. So uh, how this situation can be tackled? That's one thing. Another thing is, you also have mentioned about this uh, research skill in the degree uh, classes. Uh, but in Western countries, as I know, uh, um, uh, they have st they'll start this research in the, in the schooling itself. But we are starting it in the undergraduation level. So will such a system will make any change uh, in the uh, current uh, environment where we are where we are? Or uh, we have to do something else. Thank you, Dr. Ebi. I think uh, both these are very pertinent concerns that you have raised. But let me put it to you in this manner. We are not saying in the policy that which we came out, let us say in 2020, that we will implement the new paradigm of 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 for schools. And after that batch enters the higher education that we will implement those changes for higher education. It was never seen in a linear manner. It was supposed to be one where changes will happen in school. Parallelly, those changes would happen in higher education and in technical education and so on. Now, in Kerala, your concern that the 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 is not implemented is not correct in totality because the bulk of the CBSE affiliated schools and the ICSE affiliated school are largely following this new paradigm. Now, the state government schools will also follow that because, as I told you, the national curriculum framework for the foundational stage, that is for the ECC, the national curriculum framework for the school education, the national curriculum framework for teacher education, and the national curriculum framework for adult education, the four new curricula. Kerala government has announced that SCRT will be taking it up. They are already in the works and they are also bringing it out. And going by the fact that broadly what is being said, the question may arise only in terms of the content coverage. But in terms of the approaches to the curricular choices, the approaches to the manner in which teaching learning has to take place, moving away from road based testing of memorization to problem solving abilities and independent learning skills that children need to hone upon, will all start kicking in even under the state government schools. So there is no reason for us to really feel, see, it is not like something in black and white and which happens with a cutoff date. In education, that change evolves. So even in your higher education, let us say, as an example, Kerala is kicking in the four-year program from the 2024. In 2023, there are students who joined the undergraduate program in the old pattern of the three-year degree program, right? In your own college. Now, next year, you will do it in the four-year. You will have parallelly two streams. You will stop admission as per the old pattern. You give admission as per the new. 
but the student who is going into the second year is doing it under the th old framework the student who is coming into the first year is doing it under the new framework they go parallelly one gets phased out moment you know that all students have been examined who came in under the old framework it is only phased out when the examinations for all those students whatever that maximum duration where backlogs and supplementaries and all keep going out so that's why even when you have curriculum revisions you will have your question paper saying old pattern and new pattern revise syllabus and all that so that happens parallelly and as far as cbse schools icse schools already adopting it where they are already all of them are nep aligned the state government will do it as and when that new curriculum comes but you can't wait for that entire school the students completing their schooling and then implementing the higher education on the second part very rightly so when we said from class 6 that's why i talked about only two aspects of school education and not all the reforms because i wanted to introduce that idea that research coding all that will start from class 6 onwards and i'm sure even under the kerala state curriculum framework that they bring research skills when we say you don't give a six standard student a research project but when you give them a problem solving approach and you ask them to start working together to do a project you start honing many of their research skills so research skills actually like you rightly said is something that we nurture from schools and that doesn't happen suddenly when you are about 17 years old so that is why class 6 is where all these changes are being thought of that is why the middle stage the transition stage is the most critical one and the kind of activities that we are talking of which will allow learners to think independently and if at all they are not thinking independently you and i are responsible for it as parents because when a teacher will give a project you want your son or daughter to get better marks so you don't allow the child to do it and you start doing it yourself i'm being very honest about it but we don't allow independent work of our children so if you want research skills you are absolutely right it doesn't happen suddenly when you join a degree program it has to be nurtured from schooling we have said that very clearly in our policy and what the schools are doing now and i'm sure the kerala state will also follow suit in trying to say in their state curriculum framework also coding and other things will be taught independent projects giving students group solving activities giving them cognitive thinking abilities so many things that they are doing even now that they are doing also i see are ones which hone their research abilities so i fully endorse your view but this is something that will definitely happen and i don't think we need to worry about well parents getting confused because that kind of options will start kicking in in a couple of years and in education you cannot happen you cannot bring about change like we are standing before a firing squad because it is a slow change acceptability of it making parents advocacy to parents advocacy to students advocacy to the community all this gradually happens so it's a very slow change but definitely kerala as someone which has always been quite innovative in their education sector will cannot afford to ignore these kind of changes and it will be definitely there in place ma'am i have another concern actually like uh, this calls for a paradigm shift from a teacher the so called teacher who is concentrating much more on a lecture method to a facilitator uh, who is concentrating on an activity oriented uh, methods of teaching and learning definitely it needs a paradigm shift in the cognitive thinking of the teachers mostly they are not open up or like uh, they are not given chance for the so called development in those areas without having much more experience to or exposure to the activities they are supposed to conduct all these things uh, whether the policy makers have a thought on that truly speaking the so called orientation programs or the refresher courses have not addressed these kind of um, matters i think so uh, what would be the 
um, development or the how how would how is it going to be addressed actually? In an informal conversation that I had with one of the vice chancellors here in Kerala, and also the the recent developments that are happening in the UGC for training of trainers. This is for implementing the national education policy and basically the role of the faculty. You're very right. The conventional uh, refresher programs and orientation programs are very theoretical based. They themselves don't allow for independent thinking, if I may say so. And they, you are only subjected to either two weeks of lectures by different people, like the one you heard just now, whereas ideally, the idea should be looking at outcome based education and the whole I didn't have time to talk about it. But when you look at outcome based education and you look at learning outcomes, then when you teach a subject, not from the point of view of being able to teach it, but from the point of view of a learner having achieved some outcomes, whether it is in knowledge component or in a competency, or in a skill, when you break it down to that, automatically you will be forced to adopt different methods. Right now what is happening is that, and I'm happy that the curriculum framework of Kerala talks about it. Of course, they talked about course outcomes and they talked about program outcomes and program educational outcomes. I am breaking it down to a much lower level and there for the disciplines that you take, UGC has for 100 courses, the learning outcomes based curriculum framework. So when you teach a discipline, that discipline in that syllabus that you teach. So say for example, and I'm saying it just from random. What is society? Now, what do you want that student to understand? Theoretically, what is a society? The competency to understand and identify what goes or what are those components that we call are making up a society? Now, you want them to understand something of a skill. You give them an activity where you say you go out into the community and start working over there. Now, these, when you do this in this manner, a lecture will not suffice. A lecture will not suffice. Therefore, you are not conducting your job effectively. Therefore, the whole turnaround comes when we start looking from the learner's point of view. And mind you, in higher education, we all are going scot-free. Me included, I feel criminally responsible. I don't know where my students whom I taught, what have they become in life? Whereas in school, since the past percentage is a matter of, let me say, uh, branding of an institution in terms of the performance. Every teacher has to perform and therefore they bring out the results. Here in higher education, we are not held responsible. I taught my subject, I came out of my class. Where that student, what that student learned, whether it helped that student in actually getting a job, we are not looking at that at all. The accountability of a higher education faculty is quite remote and we do not directly attribute it to the performance of a student in the examination. Now here, instead of looking and complicating things, we only think in terms of looking at outcome based education, breaking down the syllabi that you teach and the course that you teach and the program that you cover and the educational objectives that you seek to achieve through the breakdown of learning outcomes, course outcomes, program outcomes, and program, pro, pro, program educational outcomes. Then you give activities. So when you do in schools, we prepare a lesson plan. In a lesson plan, you will also write what are the activities that the students have to do. We don't do that in higher education. So we go conventionally, chalk and talk, or maybe if it is a smart board, we use a smart board. And we only go ahead doing that. So most important is capacity building. So the new discussions that are happening is that there will be a lot of hands-on training 
of how to go about it. Now, even the simplest one of a flipped classroom, which I asked you at the beginning here, whether the participants would like to talk first. So you ask students, they are very communicative. You ask them that on this topic that we are going to talk, would you like to tell something? As they get into the understanding of a flipped classroom, you can tell them that this is what we are going to discuss tomorrow. This is where you get material to read about. Then let us have a discussion first, and then we can have a talk after that. So what will happen is, if it's a 45 minutes class, you will actually give about 20 to 25 minutes listening to them, and the remaining 20 or 25 minutes where you are talking. What happens as a consequence is that the student is actively engaging. But you need to accept that what comments they are making are not casual comments. And it is not moving away from the rigor of that subject. And that will gradually happen because they didn't do it so far. They were always asked to shut up rather than speak. So when you ask them to speak, they may hesitate. But once they realize that she means business and that I'm not going to open my trap at all until they talk, then they'll gradually understand that this is what she actually means in the class. That if we want to get her to talk, we should talk first. The other thing you can do is give them an activity. You tell them that I am going to teach this. But for this, if you are having a class of about 60, you make them into six groups or you ask them to decide a group of 10 each. They come up saying that six groups will present something on this topic first tomorrow. So they will come making either a PowerPoint or bringing something and one of them will present. You can ask all of them to talk in turns. So what will happen is they will start getting engaged with that and they are good at it. I'm sure they're good at it. It's only that we never gave them an opportunity to showcase that. The other major thing that you can do is get students of your department or your discipline to interact with students of other disciplines in the learning in the idea of multidisciplinarity that is equally important so kavita what you are saying i handled a scheme in the government of india which has now got regularized and i feel very gratified faculty induction programs we said all new assistant professors will undergo a one month and i said that time a one month residential induction program and FIP was started under the National Mission on Teachers and Teaching, what was being called as the Pandit Madan Mohan Malviya National Mission on Teachers and Teaching. Now, all the UGC HRDCs also do a one month faculty induction program. Because of COVID having kicked in, we went not having it residential, but it is a one month faculty induction program. And usually, because they can't get time out of their own colleges, they are usually done in an online mode. And so you have faculty. I have addressed yesterday for the Pune University faculty that came in from Kerala, from Gujarat, from Odisha, Chhattisgarh, Maharashtra, Karnataka, and so on. This one month faculty induction program is a recognition of the fact that we are having domain knowledge by virtue of our research qualification. But teaching is a skill and you need to kick in certain type of abilities by which they engage with the students. And in that faculty induction program, you can get opportunities to do that. So in the FIP programs that I conducted during the time that I had not retired, we had faculty who were teaching for seven years, saying that we were never knowing how to take advantage of this kind of pedagogy. And they said that they would like to be. Our criteria was first two years who are an assistant professor. But we stretched on to take in faculty who were teaching for seven years for an induction program where they were already assistant professors for six to seven years. So the kind of skills and there are opportunities for that, please. It is there. The FIP programs are there now under the, the re-Christian scheme that I handled along with HRDs is being called the Malvia Mission Scheme. The vice chancellor I was talking informally said after the curriculum is formulated by the end of this year, they are also going to kick in master trainers who will train faculty so that faculty will start moving towards these new ways of outcome-based education. So I think it will fall in place 
but yeah, right now there are avenues i think you should take advantage of them thank you ma'am uh, dr jinu joseph i think you have a query please It's Dr. Anthony Joseph who raised his hand. Okay, ma'am. I have two. Uh, okay, I have I have two questions. Uh, one is regarding uh, bilingual degree program uh, suggested in the national education program. What are the uh, what is the possibility for that? And uh, can we expect it? Uh, since I am from an autonomous college, uh, can we think about it while implementing the four-year uh, degree from the ne uh, from the coming years? And another thing is regarding the research in UG level. Actually, this is considered to be a very dynamic uh, uh, reform that has brought in by national education policy because we have the brightest students in UG and we are giving emphasis only on PG students for research. So what are the uh, possibilities, what are the, what are the provisions you as a person behind this policy uh, uh, see uh, for implementing both these? Please explain. So for the bilingual part of it, I think I have read through the four-year curriculum program I don't think the medium of instruction has anywhere been specified. I think it goes with the assumption that currently undergraduate programs are offered only in English and that we'll continue with that. But I think the demand for offering it in Malayalam language also may be something that they are not very averse to it. But it needs to be really very clear because what we understand is based on those guidelines, some very specific regulations are going to be brought out and maybe this kind of concerns which faculty are raising when they are not at, uh, opposing the idea of bilingual teaching and we are allowing students to write their answers do question papers at undergraduate level are given only in english or are they given in english and malayalam only in english. question only, only in english only in english. Only. Papers are only in english only in english and student also has the option to write only in english uh, student uh, has the opportunity to write in, in in english or in malayalam but in many subjects the the materials are not sufficient uh, the teachers are actually not considering the uh, answers in english and uh, in malayalam at par that's that's also a very important part I think that mindset change has to come in because I think somewhere down the line we started equating English with intelligence. Is that <laughs> that is the the absolute uh, disaster that we have re reached, where someone it's who communicates this is a real English, disaster, a real disaster, yes. because we yes, find who, very yes. very good students, intelligent yes. students who, who do not know English. Yes, but their communicative abilities in Malayalam must be recognized. And I think as a as a growing economy, we must understand that knowledge of a language is always seen as an additional strength. And therefore, not being able to, that doesn't mean that they should not learn English. I am not in any saying that they should not learn English. The communicative skills in English should also be there. But the freedom to write in Malayalam and to treat them on par with those who write in English is something which is a mindset change. And I think we'll have to wait for the, I don't want to give a wrong or any misinformation, but I did not see anything in the Kerala curriculum framework saying that the medium of instruction would be purely in English, which means bilingual teaching, once read, read, reading material and reference material should be forthcoming. The other aspect on research is the fact that as undergraduate teaching institutions, do we network with industry? Do we create industry academia cells? Do we create innovation clubs? Do we actually create con linkages with research laboratories? Give them research questions, ask them to start doing that. So under the four year curriculum framework that we are talking of, where we are talking about value added courses, we are talking about multidisciplinary courses, then we are talking in the fourth year of capstone courses. 
in all this i think we should take an opportunity to embed research there either by giving them industry based projects as part of internships so the four year curriculum here also says internships so we can leverage that to give intelligent students rather than an internship saying that you can do it like a minor research project and that you will get credits for that so i think it's a manner of how we interpret it that we can use that but i think having research methodology when we teach a subject and giving them that kind of scope where two students can together work on a collaborative research especially if it is in a multidisciplinary area where they collaborate in two different disciplines these are all a avenues when we wrote the policy of course we were very clear on the aspect of the functionality of higher education that higher education has two major functions of teaching and research and the third function of community engagement and social social engagement or the social outreach that we talk extension activities your nss and so on and that institutions also should be earmarked largely by the fact whether they would like to be research oriented or whether they would like to be teaching intensive oriented and the whole idea that institutions may be mapped not by the geographical jurisdiction or by the ownership of being public or private but by the character of that institution in terms of its functioning of being teaching intensive with largely undergraduate and some p pg and some doctoral program or largely research intensive with large focus on pg and doctoral and some focus on undergraduate but the idea that teaching and research needs to get equal importance at undergraduate level was our idea and that you need to establish linkages between these bodies of industry research laboratories and the academia coming together for discussions deliberations seminars and so on so that many areas you actually start breaking it down to micro level thinking and looking at the macro level implications so when i was talking about it the idea that we created that subject networks may be created so that you create a network of students in a discipline right from undergraduate pg doctoral postdoc research scholars and teachers in that coming as a community of practitioners to promote research in a given area now these are some of the things that you can explore and the policy really felt that if india needs to be a soft power then and also get global rankings see now we started because uh, the we were thinking that we are not coming in global rankings we started nirf now i am happy that kerala started kirf because you then reach some level of benchmarking and i am happy that the kirf matrix talks about research also so it is a gradual process but i think it will start kicking in and i am happy you raised uh, how do we do nurturing of research at undergraduate level but i think you have enablers that is there both in the curriculum framework and the fact that kerala is talking that if we want to be a knowledge economy it is talking about knowledge economy knowledge economy cannot happen only by teaching knowledge economy does call for research at undergraduate levels and rightly you are so you recognized the potential of our very bright students where they can go into careers of research so you have over here an icer in trivandrum you have an I, iist over here these are all research oriented institutions but we need to broad based research in our undergraduate education i fully endorse that uh, the thought that you have and nep supports that and i don't think kerala is averse to it i have not seen anything negating that part of it at all yeah ma'am shall i share one concern that is shared in the chat box yeah uh, it's given by dr jinu joseph is saying if students learning near about a subject how can they perform in a particular area up to 10th and plus 2 level they are learning all the disciplines i think he is maybe asking something like uh, the near understanding of a subject if it is only there how can they excel in a particular domain maybe like that i, I think, think so. uh, his concern is that the nep tries to make a jack of all trades and not having a specialization 
No, that's not what we are trying to say. When you say core disciplinary knowledge and you're majoring in a discipline, that is disciplinary depth. All that we are saying is in addition to the disciplinary depth and not just a superficial understanding of a discipline, you also need to have multiple knowledge disciplines exposure because the world has moved towards multidisciplinarity and multiple competencies and multiple skills. So we are nowhere saying that when you move from an I-shaped graduate to a T-shaped graduate, we are not saying that the lower bar is not there at all. We are saying the I remains as being the disciplinary depth. And that specialization has to be a very strong conceptual theoretical depth. Along with that, you will also have multiple exposure because the kind of job profiles require a mechanical engineering to understand accounting or will require a sociology student to understand certain multiple skills of digital technologies. And all areas are actually becoming so interdependent that to only talk of a specialization and if that specialization does not have jobs coming and not the kind of jobs we are talking of only running for a public service examination and government jobs, but different kind of job profiles that are there, you need to have both. But nowhere are we saying that we are making a jack of all trades and that you will not have disciplinary depth at all. It is specialization, but also with multiple exposures. Thank you, ma'am. As we don't find any more hand raises or queries in the chat box, uh, let's move to the vote of thanks. Uh, with respect, with all respect, may I invite our dear principal, Dr. Neetu George, to express the words of gratitude. Over to you, ma'am. Good evening, dear ma'am. Good evening, one and all. It was indeed a privilege and honor to have the most respected and renowned resource person. Dr. Shakila Shamsu amidst us during the past few hours. Ma'am, the session led by you was really informative and brainstorming. Thank you so much, ma'am, for accepting our invitation and also for delivering the NEP recommendations in the most adept and elaborate manner with much dexterity. Thank you so much, ma'am. I would like to thank the presence of Dr. Gabriel Simon Sattel in the initial uh, moments of the uh, webinar. Thank you so much, sir, even in his absence. I extend our heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Anthony Joseph, who did much for the conduct of uh, today's uh, webinar. Our thanks also to uh, Dr. Vinit D who also is a member, uh, who is the secretary of uh, Indian Accounting Association, Alapura. Ms. Sopna K for the note of welcome. Ms. Kavita Jacob for beautifully anchoring the program. All the IAA members who attended the webinar. Some attendees were from other states. I acknowledge their presence and also thank them. Also, the faculty members who attended the program from other colleges. And most of all, the IQAC coordinator of BAM College, Dr. A.B. Joseph Ridicola, who conceived and coordinated and organized the program in a very fruitful manner. And the faculty members of BAM College, especially Dr. Robbie A.J., who was the coordinator, Sri Resh D., Enns Matthews, etc., who rendered their support for the productive coordination of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Happy on. Thank you, Thank you uh, Principal uh, Dr. Nithu George, for your kind words. And I must uh, second what you said, that Kavita did an excellent job of anchoring this program, uh, being very soft and mild and ensuring that queries were taken in the right manner. And I thank all the participants and let me share your thoughts of a happy onam and God bless you all. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have come to the end of the session. As Fred DeVito says, if it doesn't challenge you, it doesn't change you. 
So let's all march towards being an energized, motivated, capable faculty. Thank you so much and happy Onam to one and all. Thank you very much.